This is episode number 114 featuring artist Clark Mitchell. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome everybody to the Plein Air Podcast. You know what we got to do is we got to teach our announcer, Jim Kipping, how to paint. He sounds like a guy that needs to learn how to paint. It's kind of funny that people who end up working with us end up painting, and we've had a lot of people who came to work with us, joined our team, went to the convention, and they ended up learning how to paint or getting the addiction of buying paintings. And so it's kind of fun to see that. And of course, that's what we should do with our friends, right? Get them addicted to painting because it changes their lives and get them buying paintings. We need more people buying paintings, right? Speaking of the convention, we're going to have an art show again this year at the convention. Uh, we have a faculty art show and then attendees can also buy an easel and you can put up your work for sale. We have about 150 easels. We sold a lot of art last uh, few years, and we open it up to the public. We advertise it to the public, but most of the paintings are sold to other painters, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, you can once you've registered for the convention, you got to be uh, going to the convention to be able to be in the art show. It's going to be pretty cool because you're going to be in downtown San Francisco. We'll probably pull some people in and sell some more paintings. Uh, also, the exhibit hall of the Plein Air Convention is going to be open to um the public so they can help the vendors out and the vendors will sell more stuff. Um, But anybody wanting to attend the great sessions, of course, at the convention has to get a ticket. And if you haven't got yours, don't delay. A lot of people are coming. We're building momentum and a lot of people will be there. It's homecoming, you know, so a lot of people coming back. Anyway, the plein air convention is, as you probably know by now, a painter's paradise. It's the world's largest um, paint out essentially, but it's got instruction all day long. And then we go out and paint. And for the people who don't want to go out and paint, don't want to deal with traffic or parking, or just don't feel safe doing that. We also this year have indoor painting. We've got an indoor painting arena. So you want to check that out. So you don't even have to leave the hotel if you don't want to. It's kind of ironic indoor plein air. Well, you know, it's kind of like standing out and looking out the window, except we have these big screen videos that are projecting the light and the sound and the Uh, feel of the places that we're painting so it's kind of like you know painting from a tv set i suppose only a great big one uh, and and uh for a long periods of time anyway uh, you'd think i'd learn my lesson about painting it's uh, the weather has been really good here and uh, we kind of have an early spring and so i've um I painted in two foot deep snow a few weeks ago when I was in Idaho with Lori McNee, but I kind of am a fair weather painter. I like to get out when it's nice and sunny and warm. And anyway, it's been really great. And the blue bonnets are going to be coming up. So I want to get into practice for those. It's got carpets of blue flowers. It's really beautiful. Anyway, you'd think I'd learned my lesson though, because I, I keep a backpack ready to go so I can grab it and go. I try never to take paints out of my plein air kit for my studio, or I never take brushes or whatever else from my studio, or from my uh, plein air kit for my studio, because what'll happen is I'll go out and plein air and then I'll forget something like a tube of color that I really want. Well, this week I went out and I, and I went to put my, reach into my bag and get my brush clip, my easel brush clip and hang it on the side of my easel. And I like it because it stabilizes my umbrella, but it's also so my brushes are kind of right there in front of me. And anyway, it wasn't there. And I remembered that I had somebody visiting and they liked the brush clip. So I took it off my studio easel and gave it to them. Then I pulled the one out of my bag and put it on the studio easel. So now I don't have it in my bag. So I got to go to easelbrushclip.com and get another one. Anyway, um, kind of a, a, a cool thing to find out how addicted you get to a product. Anyway, we've got a great interview today. Uh, Clark Mitchell, you're going to love this interview. And um, After the interview, I'll answer some art marketing questions if it's okay with you. Hang with us. But first, let's get right to the interview. Hey, Clark Mitchell, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me, Eric. Where do we find you today? 
Um, well, I was in my studio, but now um, up in the house, uh, about three minutes away. And where's the house? Um, uh, sorry, of course, Northern California, uh, Sonoma County, ah. and out in the country. Oh, beautiful. And and uh, what part of Sonoma County are you in? Um, the southern part. And uh, last night was the first night we got cold enough. We had snow on the hills up above us. So oh, I know really? for all the people in the Midwest, uh, <laughs> that's a joke. But uh, for us, it was pretty cold. Well, that's pretty and, unusual. Uh, spe- it is indeed, and uh, absolutely beautiful this morning. So, you know, the, the my friends, I, I used to live out in the San Francisco Bay Area, and my friends used to say, Napa is auto parts, Sonoma is really <laughs> the beautiful wine country. And though Napa tends to be more well-known as wine country, Sonoma is unbelievably beautiful. Much more relaxed, I would say, as well, yeah. Um, I'm probably not in a lot more affordable, but uh, certainly beautiful. Oh. But sure, a beautiful place to paint. I, I was out there uh, just recently. We were kind of looking around the area trying to figure out where we were going to paint. We ended up, um, we're, we're going to be painting at one of the wineries there, uh, which will be announced at the convention. But the um, the area All right. the area is so spectacularly beautiful. What I'm going to recommend to people when they come out to the convention is uh, plan to just spend the weekend in wine country, you know, get a, leave the hotel in San Francisco, get a hotel out in Sonoma or that area because, you know, you could literally paint a lifetime out there. There's so much around every corner. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, so close to the coast because, of course, the county goes all the way to the, to the ocean and uh, to the east, into the hills, um, distant views, Valley floor, the Russian River, it's spectacular. You're absolutely right. Yeah, there's really a lot. I mean, you know, for, for I used to go up there um, just about every week. Uh, my buddies and I would go painting on Thursdays, and uh, I'd take the day <laughs> off from work, and we'd drive up there, and we'd just we'd paint vineyards all day. And, uh, you know, I must have done 100 vineyard paintings, but I could never get enough. And, and more vineyards all the time, and uh, such terrain... Um, a lot of them up on the hillsides now too. Um, so even more interesting, uh, terrain. Well, it makes it even more that, uh, more, more special to have those beautiful vistas of the, of the streaks of vineyards on the hills makes it for sure. It's beautiful. So how autumn, autumn, especially. Yeah. Oh yeah. Autumn, Go ahead. Absolutely. And, and, uh, have you been in that particular area your whole life, or you grew up there? What's the story? No, I grew up in, in Denver, out in the country. Um, moved to California in the 70s. and have been in Sonoma County since the 80s. So one of the things that, um, um, uh, um, I'll just ask you this question now since we're talking about it, but, you know, the Plain Air Convention is coming up. It's in San Francisco, and um, I've had... A, a few people who actually said to me, you know, I'm not coming. And I said, why? And they said, well, because um, there are no landscapes to paint. <laughs> and, and so uh, tell them why they ought to come to the Bay Area to paint. Well, even within San Francisco, we've got Golden Gate Park, um, the coastline is spectacular along there, looking across to Marin County, the Marin Headlands. Um, Beautiful beaches, uh, not not the sunny Southern California beaches with uh, um, scantily clad surfers, but uh, definitely um, beautiful vistas here. Well, you've got um, the big East rocks, Bay, big rocks with the crashing waves. Yeah, um, Marin County right across the bridge. Um, it's just endless places to paint. Um, open space there that uh no fees for parking so it's terrific um going up the headlands and looking across at san francisco looking at the golden gate bridge um down in sausalito views across to the east bay it's really endless what i find uh, I really a friend what i find really amazing out there are the trees um you know uh, where i live now we have we have a lot of beautiful trees but the trees out there You've got these, uh, especially by the Golden Gate Bridge and, and lands in and that whole area, you've got these incredible 
beautifully poetically shaped cedar trees. You have all these amazing eucalyptus trees, kind of the ones that you used to see in the uh, Percy Gray paintings. Uh, just you exactly, know, yeah. so beautifully poetic. And then when I, when I was out in the in wine country looking around, there's just hundreds and hundreds of those beautiful eucalyptus trees everywhere. That's really spectacular. And gnarly old oak trees all through Sonoma and Marin County. Um, cypress, Monterey cypress that are wind beaten and, and picturesque. Well, you talked a little bit. I was looking at your blog in preparation, and, and you had a blog about um, uh, great scenes are worth the effort. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? You know, why, why a great scene is really important for a painter? I know it seems like kind of a silly question. <laughs> I know. Um, what do you mean by a great scene? Let me, so that I can get more specific to in, in your in my answer. Well, what do you mean by a great scene? Um, majestic. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's much better. Yeah. Um, I don't think every painting has to be spectacular and majestic location, but, uh, Certainly something that's evocative, something that um, excites the viewer, makes them want to uh, be in that place and uh, sort of travel through that scene. Um, and uh, you were saying making the effort to uh, um, get to a place like that um, doesn't necessarily mean a mile hike or, or two miles. You know, I, I'm a ridiculously uh, heavy laden artist with all the material I take with me. I don't have just a little Peshad box and a, a limited palette of oils because as a pastelist, I've got a box of pastels. I've got an easel um, and uh, a backpack full of supplies. Um, so I don't prefer to walk a mile or so, but it's certainly well worth it to uh, um, walk in a ways to find that, that perfect place. Um, I'm going painting this afternoon with a friend um, because it's been raining so much lately. Uh, the waterfalls are just spectacular. And, and, and uh, I've walked with her in a, a few miles. Uh, today, we're just going to be walking for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. But uh, well worth it to go through the mud and the, uh, the up and down of the trails to get to a place like that. You know, I, I probably um, mentioned this on the on the uh, podcast before, but I, I studied photography with a an art instructor by the name of Fred Picker who invented uh, what was called the zone system, which he got essentially from learning from Ansel Adams. And he had award-winning photographs. His photographs were in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was the real deal. And he was talking to us about the importance of going to the pain to get the right scene. And the, the same thing is really true for painters. He, <laughs> going he, to the pain? Going through the pain. He said, you know, most photographers won't get up at four o'clock in the morning and hike in somewhere with their gear. And, and you know, he said it's, it's the ones that hike a little extra further, that get up a little earlier, that wait a little longer. And they're the ones who end up capturing the best photographs. Do you really think that's true in, in painting? I uh, certainly do. I can't say I'm one of those that gets up at four in the morning too often. <laughs> but if you know, if 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 I've got some other artists that are encouraging me, and then we know where we're going to end up, um, definitely it's it's worth it. Um, I, there's something I, I one thing I don't like is getting in a car with four or five other artists. We're not sure where we're going to go paint, and we drive around, and no one will just say, "Let's just stop here." Yeah, nobody wants to make a commitment. Right. Oh, around the next end, I'm sure it's going to be. I remember a place just a little farther up the road. Yeah. How many How many times have we all driven around, uh, you know, and, and killed a couple of hours trying to find the right place? Yeah, and, and being part of a number of plenary events throughout the year. Um, you really learn to just go with your instinct and say, I'm going to find something to paint if I stop here. Because you can really, as you said, waste hours. Well, you know, if you take, you take an artist like Joe Paquette, and Joe's going to be on the stage at the plein air convention. And Joe, you you could sit Joe down in any alley somewhere, and he would come up with a beautiful <laughs> painting. 
uh, because and, and I think that would be a great training exercise actually for a workshop is just to you know show up in some place and say okay figure out how to make beauty out of this spot if this is the only option you've got how do you how do you do that how do you get yourself inspired yeah uh, a spectacular demo I still remember to this day. I was in a workshop with Clyde Aspavig and everyone, groupies, you know, people waiting to buy whatever demo he comes up with. And uh, we're all wandering around. This is in, in New Mexico, north of, of um, Santa Fe. And we're all wandering around watching what he's going to choose to paint. And he painted a um, plastic sheet uh, tarp over a cement mixer. And... <laughs> People were so disappointed, and it was a spectacular painting. You know, it was just <laughs> learned so much from watching him do that. So why don't we uh, rewind just a little bit, Clark, and and why don't we understand a little bit about you and how this whole um, art influence happened in your life? Um, can you kind of give us some early memories of art? Uh, I'd be happy to. Yeah, um, the first piece of art that I remember getting acclaim for was a um, uh, on, on a piece of plywood um, rice grains that I had dyed and this must have been under the uh, tutelage of an, uh, an elementary school art teacher I dyed rice grains put them in the shape of a dog's head painted the background and and it got put up in the uh, there was sort of a glass window in the elementary school with a cabinet with various objects that we were all supposed to look at. And of course, all the kids ran on by to get to the school bus. Uh, but it was so exciting to have my art up there on the wall. And uh, uh, one thing, uh, so just this last week, I've been um, going back in time Exactly 50 years ago, um, this year and, and the end of last year, um, when I was 17, my parents thought, thought it would be a good idea. And I, was, I had a number of years of Spanish. And so I went to a, um, it wasn't an exchange program, but I was one of, of 30 boys who went to Barcelona and lived in a Spanish family for a year. Wow. And it was an incredibly seminal time for me. You know, at the time it was like terrified Denver teen. What, you know, what am I doing? Oh no, I'm going to be away from my comfort zone and, uh, learned and saw so much. Um, we went through the Louvre and, uh, Versailles on a, a private tour, um, on the way there. And then once in Barcelona, um, Picasso museum, um, painting of Dali, um, trying to think, uh, where are my notes? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some incredible. Um, and I, I, li I lived in a house that was built by an aide of um, Gaudi. Well, a lot of people don't know about Gaudi and the, uh, the influence in Barcelona and around the world. Um, I, I don't know what word I'd use. Visionary? Um, his, his masterwork, uh, the Cathedral La Sagrada Familia, that's um, still being built um, over 100 years later and might be finished someday, is the most spectacular, um, most fanciful um, um, building I've ever seen. The building hardly does it justice. Um, I'm trying, um, uh, for Spain, as Arte Moderno, um, Ar, Ar Nouveau, um, but he really took it to a, a whole nother level, um, stained glass, uh, wrought iron and, um, broken tile put back together in mosaic patterns that are just spectacular. Um, he did parks, um, in Barcelona and a number of, of houses, apartment buildings, um, that back then were uh, available to the public, but I went back a few years ago and toured one of the buildings in Barcelona. There's just, I mean, every direction you turned in um, was just a marvel and naturalistic. Um, no, no hard edges, no straight edges, no corners, <laughs> everything rounded. And, and uh, so, you know, 
for a, a, a kid, it was it was magical, and uh, really got I'm sure inspired my mind, got my mind moving in directions it never would have had I stayed in Denver. <laughs> right. Now, were you doing any art in uh, in Barcelona while you were there for the year? Uh, there was no art curriculum in the in the school, and and what I mostly did was doodle pen and ink doodles, <laughs> which um, I still have a few of them to this day. And uh, well, they, I they need to go they, into uh, the world famous Clark Mitchell Museum at some point. The, the archives, yes. <laughs> um, and and we would take uh, trips throughout the rest of Spain. Um, so we uh, the, saw the mosque in Cordoba, the Alhambra, um, saw the um, uh, prehistoric um, cave paintings in Altamira, which the public isn't allowed to go into anymore uh, other than special tours. It was pretty amazing um, what we got to do as teenage boys, of course, with our coats and ties and <laughs> Very respectful, being watched over carefully by the um, uh, Roman aqueducts. It's like it, sort of my mind was being expanded in every direction. So how did you transform uh, into uh, becoming a full-time artist? Did you end up in a, uh, did you go to school for art? Did you end up in another career? Tell us about that. Um, I did go to school for art. Um my sort of the two different directions I was going in that actually dovetailed for a landscape artist was uh, horticulture and um, art. And I, I went, uh, got a bachelor's in art, Colorado College, um, and then um, went on at City College in San Francisco, took horticulture classes, and also took, um, I went to the Academy of Art College, which at that time was much less geared towards. Um, commercial art than it is now. Um, you see ads all over the, the country now for it. Um, but uh, by um, I sort of supported myself by doing uh, maintenance gardening for people. And in San Francisco, that means pretty tiny plots. It worked fine. Um, once I moved out to Sonoma County, then, of course, I would have had to have a whole crew of... Uh, people working with me and big power, power equipment and really um, started focusing more on my artwork um, as a hopefully um, sustaining possibility. And it, 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 I've been blessed over the years um, that one way or another, I'm still here and now have a spectacular studio and have done art full time, I'd say for maybe 30 years. So was there a, a turning point, uh, a seminal moment that really made the difference between just being a guy who was trying to make a living as an artist and, and being able to really cement that as a, a career? Um, was there something that, that happened or occurred, uh, something that could possibly be a lesson for the rest of us? Oh, boy, as, as a lesson, I don't know. Um, one thing that pops up is that um, my godfather, who had a condo in Kauai, gave me five weeks at the condo in a, a, a junker of a car to uh, drive around, and it was just to paint. And the understanding was that at the end of the five weeks, he would get to choose whatever paintings I had done and he wanted. Um, so... That made a huge difference. I, I painted several hours every day. Um, and then several years later, about the time I was 30, um, he commissioned me to do paintings for, a, he was a partner in a golf club down in Palm Desert, California, and uh, hired me to do paintings for that. So just having somebody else have that kind of confidence in my artwork really helped me say, you yeah, know, maybe I am an artist and maybe this could work. Um, uh, as a lesson to other people, I don't know. Be, <laughs> be nice to your godfather. <laughs> <laughs> well, one one of the things I'm always curious about is, I, I, you know, as I teach art marketing, I'm I'm trying to understand what different people went through at different times, and if they can look back on their careers, you've had a very long, healthy career, 
And uh, looking back, if if you were going to give some advice to, let's say, a, a younger you, somebody who is, you know, 30 years old, 25 years old, and say, okay, um, you're going to go make an art career. Here's what I would recommend that you do. Here's what I didn't do. Here's what I did do. What are the things that you would tell somebody who's a, a younger you? Well, certainly practice all the time. Um, I did not um, sit in cafes and draw people. And, and I think that I know a lot of artists for whom that's really um, been a boon, a, a, a real teaching um, experience, a learning experience. Um, but certainly practicing all the time. And uh, one thing my art teachers said, because I didn't say that I, I did go to, um, um, or I took art classes whenever I could in all the schools. And the teachers always said, use the um, best materials that you can. Don't use student grade, don't scrimp, um, in hopes that, that, yeah, you know, and again, I was I've been blessed enough that I didn't have to eat beans and rice and, and uh, watch every penny, um, hoping hoping to make the rent for the next month. You know, I can't say that there haven't been months like that. But uh, so uh, back to what would I tell an artist? Um, other than use, using using the, the best materials possible. Um, Learn. Uh, uh, watch as many demos as possible. Um, it's incredible what's possible nowadays. Uh, everything online and so many different artists. And very inexpensively, you can watch some of the best artists in the world paint. Um, really listen to what they have to say. Um, don't necessarily copy them and don't necessarily believe that everything they say is the the only answer um you know how do you instill confidence in a young artist that's a, um that's a big one um it, it helps of course when you get into shows you know, that would be another thing don't don't be uh, shy about showing your work there there are any number of places in any kind of any town large or small where you can show your work it might not be particularly glamorous to that point, Clark, uh, you, you know, you have to get used to the experiences of putting yourself out there. And, and uh, many artists being insecure or not having the confidence, uh, not being exactly sure how people are going to respond to a show of their work. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily want to start out at the Louvre, not that you could. But yeah. I, I think the idea is if you can, if you, you can even just get your work hanging in a local restaurant and have them do an opening or a show so that you have the the experience of interacting with people and answering questions. Uh, those things over time actually help. They help you come out of your shell. They help you learn to communicate. They help you learn to sell. Um, you know, they help in a lot of ways. So I, th I think that's actually pretty good advice, just getting yourself out there. Yeah, wherever possible. And so many of my students, um, will go, oh, no, I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing, or I'm not any good. And I just think, well, if you keep saying that, of course that's true. <laughs> um, and it does, it's a big leap to finally say, I'm an artist. You know, I might not be the best artist, but I'm an artist. I, I don't know, you're sort of asking about a particular moment or a particular time. Um, and I, I don't come up with any one thing, but to uh, just the point when I said, you know, I'm an artist. For good or bad, um, I'm going to paint. Uh, made a huge difference. Because then I put sort of all, all my um, energy behind being an artist rather than, oh, I dabble. I'm a dabbler. <laughs> so uh, did you start out with pastel or did you start out in some other medium? Um, I was taking art classes in a variety, you know, elementary school um, and then high school, um, taking art classes in a variety of different mediums. Um, but my father, uh, when I was pretty young, he had, he had uh, bicycled in Europe 
after college and sent all kinds of things home. And I don't know why he bought a box of Schmenka pastels. They're a company that's still around, beautiful, soft German pastels, um, very rich color. And he gave me this box that was pretty battered and that some of them had been used, but I never saw a thing that he ever did with them. Um, but a box of Schmenka pastels that got me going in that medium, um, I, I worked in oils, watercolors, um, but the two that stuck were oils and pastels. And I took um, some classes in, in oil painting, but it wasn't until I was probably about 25, maybe on to 30, that I, I um, took a workshop with Albert Tandell and ended up taking three other workshops consecutive years with him and and that really um in that particular medium got me so excited and realizing the potential uh and back then they didn't have the um acclaim that they do now you know they they should have but uh you know the big mediums were watercolor and and oil acrylics were coming into their own boy it makes me sound ancient <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you are ancient. <laughs> Just oh, kidding. It takes one to be able to say that. I, I, I'm right up yeah. there. With you. So, um, you know, you mentioned Albert. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it seems to me that, uh, you know, we all, if, if we're interested in our careers, if we're, we're continually learning, we're always trying to absorb new and different things. And, and uh, you and I are around a lot of artists. We, we get to watch other artists at work because of events and conventions and things like that. And, you know, sometimes you get to the point where you just think you've seen it all. You, you think that uh, every answer has been revealed to you. And um, last year after the plein air convention in Santa Fe, um, Albert invited me over to his studio. And um, I, I wish it were on video because it started out with he said, um, you know, do you know how to dance? And I said, well, no, not actually. <laughs> and so a Albert actually embraced me and he put some music on and he's teaching me a four step. It was like a comedy routine, right? It's, and, I, and, and I was, I was having a little trouble with my manhood at that moment in time. And so, you know, here we are. You weren't I'm, leading. I take it. I'm, I'm dancing around the studio with Albert Handel. I mean, here's this legend, and here I am dancing in his studio on a Saturday morning. It was very cool, but but that's not the the story. I was really going to tell is that he he pulled out some pastel and said, "Now I want to show you something that that took me 30 years to learn." And he and he laid down a color, and then he went out and he found the exact same value in another color, and he laid it down right next to it, and he created this sense of form that was incredible. And I know you know what I'm talking about because you've been through this with him. And yeah. it was it was that moment that I said, Albert, can you do this in oil? He said, yeah, let me show you. So he pulled out oils because I'm an oil painter, and, and he pulled it out and, and, and showed me in oils. And I said, Albert, you, we got to do a video on this. You've never done a video on this specific subject. So we did this this incredible video with Albert uh, earlier this year. But, uh, you know, it's just like every time you turn around and you think you've heard it all, then somebody like that just blows you away with something entirely new. Where do you think your best lessons came from? You mentioned Albert. Um, talk to me about some of the mentors and maybe some of the things that you learned from those mentors. Um, uh, one of the earliest oil painter teach oil painting teachers because I worked with Albert mostly in pastels. And oil painting was Michael Lynch, oh, wow. um, who isn't as excuse me. I said wow. Oh well, I was taking workshops. You know, that's sort of another lesson I tell a, a young artist is take workshops with anyone you can afford that, that's going to teach you that something. Um, it was incredible to watch Michael do demos and he taught me about um, value to lighten the value of something as it even a, a, a pathway um, into a painting, a little country road or something, lighten the values that goes farther back. And it's like, well, of course that's kept me in good stead ever since. Um, I'm trying to think specifics. Um, William Hook, uh, acrylic painter. I, for a while I was playing with acrylics just so that I could work with him. 
and uh, just um, his choice of colors, so clean and uh, concise. Um, Skip Whitcomb um, works in both oils and pastels, and, and it's just a marvel to watch him paint. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific lesson that I learned. I'm trying to... Um, I know you talk a lot about some books that were influential in your web, on your website, some books that, that you, you think had a pretty big impact um, on your painting. Ooh, I better get my website up so I can remember what I <laughs> talked about. Well, I'll tell you what they were. Uh, one of them was Kevin's book, uh, Landscape Painting Inside and Out. Um, one of the great standards, if you can even find them anymore, is Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. Um, Edgar Payne, Composition of Outdoor Painting, which is still being produced thanks to the um, uh, this gallery in Carmel that's offering it. Um, Richard Schmid's Alla Prima, um, Michael Albala's uh, Landscape Painting, and then you've got a Pastel Carol Katchen Painting the Landscape in Pastel with Albert and Anna Louise West, Anita Louise West, and then The Art of Pastel with Alan Flatman. How'd I do? Wow, what a memory. <laughs> well, I'm reading um, it. I'm reading um, it as we speak. I, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I'm teasing. Um, I was, every one of those books has been helpful in so many ways. Um, po probably the, the one that's most comprehensive would be Alla Prima, um, Richard Schmidt's book. Uh, every time I pick it up, there's something more to learn. And, uh, and then he keeps coming out with new additions and adding and refining and adding more images. And it's just like, what a, a treasure trove. Yeah. He's a, he's a truly a national treasure uh, for, for those of us who are artists. He's very giving Indeed. and, and yeah. very interested in, in uh, making sure that he leaves a legacy of instruction behind. So if you were to go back to the beginning of your career, are there any painters that were around then that aren't around anymore that you had a chance to meet or paint with that we might know? Oh, you know, that you might know? Probably not. You know, Denver was, I don't know, I wouldn't say off the map, but um, is a inspirational people that I would see in museums, things like that, but not that I really, you know, not, I didn't get to see a lot of artists paint. You know, I could I guess I wasn't really thinking about it. I, I did see Richard Schmidt do a, a demo. Um, and, uh, I think it was Artists of America um, show in Denver. Um, I'm trying to think who else. It wasn't really until I started working with Albert that I saw artists work um, on a, you know, an artist who really had a national reputation. Um, you know, I had some great art teachers, of course, and they inspired me enough and, and didn't discourage me. Um, so, uh, but, but I, I wouldn't, nobody would really know their names. So in terms of, uh, plein air painting versus studio painting, um, what's your ratio? Do you have one? Do you, do, do, do you make a lot of stuff up from, from memory? Do you use a lot of photographs? Do you make sure that you're using a study? for every studio painting, what's your process like? Um, I never make things up. I've never been good at that. I just become generic kind of flat blah paintings. Um, so I always either work f um, on location or from um, photos, um, sketches that I've done on location or even completed paintings that I, I expand. Um, really uh, find that the most exciting. And, and often, or I'll typically take photo references, even if I'm doing a plein air painting. Um, Albert taught all of his students, you know, to take a photo at the beginning of a plein air session, in the middle and at the end, because there's going to be something different in each, all three of them. And um, you might find you love what's at the end, um, rather than what was at the beginning. Um, so I, I do work quite a bit from photos and I teach painting from photos, um, but always tell artists, you know, you're going to learn way more if you keep going out to paint whenever possible, because there's just so much the camera can't catch, even our great digital cameras now. 
Yeah, well, there's so much detail and shadows that you just can't get into a camera. Um, and you, and, and yeah. it's hard to capture that sense of form. Um, I, I had a, um, a Russian master visit my studio one time, and he walked in. I had a bunch of paintings laying out on the floor. I totally didn't expect this. And he, he went, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And I said, what? He said, you did those on location. Huh. He said, the rest are crap. <laughs> wow. And he was right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't trained. My eye wasn't trained well enough at the time that I could tell that. But, but now I think most, most people like you can walk into somebody's studio and tell which ones were done on location and which ones were done from photographs. Do you believe that? Uh, probably so. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, of course hope that my work is less obvious, but you know, I, I don't have that, um, objectivity sometimes. Um, hopefully I've learned enough from location painting that I can give some sense of life to, uh, my studio work too. Clark, why do you paint? Why, that, why do I paint? Oh boy. I would wither away. If I didn't paint, I, I really don't know what else I would do. I think about that sometimes, you know, if there's a lean time, I think, what could I do? You know, what job could I get and other than being an Uber driver, which I would hate. <laughs> um, I just, I don't know what else I could do, but paint, you know, it, it, I, I go five days without painting, you know, maybe sometimes on a trip when I just can't have art materials with me and, I just start going nuts and can't figure out why. And then, oh, of course, I'm not doing any artwork. I'm not getting my hands dirty. I'm not really, you know, but of course, even, even then, I'm sure you find this also. You're just constantly looking at what's in front of you and kind of, oh, what color is that? How would I mix that? What colors would I put together? Which, which is lighter and which is darker? And, you know, compare that to the lightness of the sky and, you know, I think our, our minds are constantly sifting through information. Uh, once you get in the habit of, of putting down on paper or canvas. Absolutely. So uh, you were asking about a percentage of, of, of plein air to studio. I don't think I don't think I answered that. And um, it really depends on the season. I don't go out as often in the winter as I do in the summer, even though our winters are pretty darn mild here. I was going to say, um, <laughs> it's, what, it's, it's uh, <laughs> 60 degrees instead of 80 degrees? Oh, come on. We get down to 40 sometimes. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, we did have frost last night. Um, but, yeah. Um, I'm, and percentage of oil to pastel has shifted a great deal. You know, probably 50-50 now. Whereas, you know, for years I was only working in oil, in, in pastels, excuse me. Um, is there a, a time when oil's more appropriate than pastel? Is there something you, that, that helps you determine, oh, I have to do this one in oil versus I have to do this one in pastel? Uh, size is, is the, the big um, determining factor. If I'm doing anything over... Yeah, 12, 16, 12. You know, some of the uh, plein air, I'm, I'm doing larger plein air paintings for some of these events. So um, 24 was probably the biggest dimension that I've, I've done in the last few years, uh, plein air, 24 inches, one direction or the other. Um, anything bigger than that, and it just, to me, doesn't make sense to have to put glass over it. Um, and, and the whole package just gets so heavy when you put a frame and glass and then backing and all of that. Um, I'd really prefer to do an oil. Um, I still feel like after 10 or so years back into oil painting, um, because as I said, as a teenager, I worked in oils and off and on. Um, but back into them, I'm still delighted and excited by color mixing in oils. You know, I still I almost learn every every painting. I learn something more about color mixing, and I'm I have to admit I have never made one of those color charts. What Richard Schmidt and many other artists recommend and, and do color charts of of mixing all the colors I have with each other to varying degrees, and you get 300 little boxes of um, different values and, te and color temperatures. So I know. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have so many surprises in my own paintings if I 
went ahead and did that, but I, I prefer to just be amazed at how did I get that color? And, and it's always a challenge to re- recreate it. So, yeah, yeah, I the get next that. Time, yeah. Yeah, we just came out with a new book with John Potoshnik, and and uh, I call it a color cookbook. And, and what he, he he walked into the studio one day we were shooting a video, and he had this pile of paintings. And I said, "What's that?" He says, "Oh, I'm I'm working on a project. I thought I'd show you." So he pulls out dozens and dozens and dozens of small paintings, and they're all the same subject, but they're all completely different. They all have different moods. Uh, and I said, what, "What is this?" He says, "Well, I've." I've kind of taken color to the next level and I've kind of figured out this, this new system. And he said, so he showed me his system and he says, okay, this is all done with the same three colors in white. But you know, if you focus emphasis on this one and de-emphasize this one, you get these different effects. And, and though it was similar to what I had always seen, it never had completely before. So I said, John, we have to do a video and a book on this. And so we came out with this cookbook essentially uh, it's called limited palette something. And anyway, the idea is that you can go to a square of one of those paintings and pick the mood, and then it shows you exactly how he mixed it. And then you ah. you said, you know, the problem is I get a color and then I can never figure out how to replicate it. So this way, it you know, you go and you can replicate it. So it you sure. know it comes with a little palette so you can mix it on top of the book and and match the colors and, and, and just go in and say, okay, I want to take this painting, but instead of being a bright sunny day, I want it to feel like a dark nocturne. And it shows you exactly how to do that. So it's, it's kind of really cool. So you'd love it. I am uh, totally in, in um, amazement of artists who are limited palette painters because as a pastelist, I've got a box with <laughs> probably 150 different chunks of color. Yeah. And to have to watch somebody paint using five colors or or seven colors, it just amazes me. Yeah. Well, and you get you know I like colors. I like to buy colors. I'm always buying colors at the art store, and uh, because it's you know it's fun to try new things. But every time you add a different color, you screw everything else up, right? It's it's so, yeah. but, but when you're doing four colors, or three colors, and white. You always get perfect harmony, no matter what. That's true. But I'm like you. I like to do a lot of colors. So you, you've been doing a lot of experimentation with um, what I would call some panoramic format canvases where you're doing like um, one by two or one to three formats. You want to talk to me about that a little bit? You know, I really find that that's the way we look at the landscape, um, typically, is a broad vista. And, and, you know, that's not a standard frame size. It's not typically a standard canvas size with pre-stretched canvas. And I just find that they're so exciting, and they kind of force me to see, to uh, um, compose compositions in a, um, to me, exciting format. Um, oh, I had some more to say about that, but I can't think. Well, um, luckily, as a pastelist, I can cut my paper to to that form, and then I, you know, pre-order um, re- uh, frames, not ready-made, of course, um, to fit the formats. And uh, um, John Pence, who was uh, my art dealer for a number of years, used to call them my sofa paintings. Sofa paintings. (laughs) Sofa paintings, yes. But in a good way. Yeah, having John Pence close his gallery and retire was one of the tragedies of the art world. You know, what a great dealer he was. Yes, and, and a great guy. Yeah, terrific guy. Very intimidating. You know, when I was younger... And, and I, I was fortunate to be taken on by him when I was fairly young. <laughs> the first few years going into the gallery, it would be uh, knees quaking a little bit, but we got to be good friends. Well, he, I guess he worked in the Johnson administration as a speechwriter or something. So pretty accomplished guy. Anyway, it was a, it's a real loss to the art world to have him, him uh, gone. Um, 
in terms of his gallery. It's it's real tragedy. So, um, you, you know, speaking of galleries, you, you know, this format, this this panoramic format, uh, do do those sell pretty well? I've you know I've never really asked anybody that question. If it ma- if it matters, do people? But they do. Them? I th- I think you know often people will say just what I say is like well that's the way we look at the landscape, and I think that they do go very well over a <laughs> sofa, <laughs> um, and it's it's kind of uh, and I, sometimes I'll I'll flip them and do verticals and people love that because it, it's like oh we have just that size wall space left. Now, I do my best to encourage collectors to rotate their art so that everything stays fresh. You know, maybe even store some things for six months or a year and put up other paintings. And uh, that's what we do at our home is um, three or four times a year, change all the art. Because I've got way too much from other artists and things I've collected um, to see it all. And I want to see it all over time. Um, so I, I do encourage collectors, but they don't really, not many of them take me up on the idea that uh, they should be rotating their art. I think they take it as a sales ploy. Well, it it probably is to some extent, but it's really true. I mean, you know, after after you've had something hanging in your house for a long period of time, you don't even notice it anymore. But the minute you replace it with something else, you're suddenly enjoying it. And, and even if it's taking the same... 10 paintings and hanging them in 10 different spots, but keeping all the same paintings in the house, it's, it makes them yeah. stand out. I just noticed that because I, I have a, a painting that, um, that I just moved, uh, or I should say my wife moved, and uh, I hadn't even noticed it for the longest time, and all of a sudden I'm staring at it again. It comes back to life, yeah. But I think it's a great sales ploy, too, um, because... Uh, it's always a nice thing to have a collector with a, a uh, warehouse full of paintings. <laughs> I agree. Uh, and, and a collector who's addicted to buying art. So Over the if, years, I've had a few of those. <laughs> so if, uh, heaven forbid, there were a fire and you could grab the one, one painting out of your collection, what would you grab? Oh, boy. Um... I have a wonderful painting by Randy Sexton of a, a motorcycle, two motorcycles parked on the street in Palm Springs. Um, probably that. Um, I have some prints. Now I love serographs and I've never had the patience to, to clean the screens for silk screens um, that is necessary. So other than taking classes in, in college, um, I haven't produced many myself, but, um, oh God, now I can't think of his name. Darn it. Um, anyway, a New Mexico painter who um, is no longer alive. Um, some, um, Kate Crazen is another um, serigrapher uh, whose work I might try and grab. Hmm. Um, now deceased New Mexico artist, hmm. uh, but definitely Randy Sexton's painting comes to the top of my mind. Uh, well, that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, Clark, um, any final thoughts before we wrap this up? Well, gosh, my notes went way on beyond this. <laughs> no, <laughs> I've, I've really appreciated this. I'm, I'm looking forward to the convention. I love that it's sort of in my backyard. And uh, it'll be so amazing to uh, paint with 300 other artists. What number are you hoping to get to this year for attendees? You know, you never know till it's at the end. And and I actually think that uh, San Francisco will end up being a little bit smaller than last year. Uh, last year in, in um, Santa Fe, we had darn near close to, I don't know, 900 or 1,000 people. And so Whoa. the facility, the facility in San Francisco is um, it's bigger in some ways and smaller in some ways. And so we'll probably have a little bit smaller group of people. And um, and so it's it's kind of hard to know. But, you know, when you it, it seems like a lot, but it doesn't feel like a lot. You know, it's like it, it kind of depends on where you sit and it kind of depends on what you're involved in. But you really only have that big group of people together. 
you know, for, for a few sessions uh, throughout the week. Otherwise, yeah. everybody's in smaller, intimate settings. And, you know, there's a lot of people who don't go to the paint outs. Um, this year we're doing something kind of interesting. It's it's kind of an oxymoron. Um, we've had a, a few comments from some people who are a little intimidated by San Francisco. And uh, because of driving or parking or big city issues. And so... Uh, some of those people have kind of said, well, I'm not sure I'm going to come. And so what we did to overcome that is we, we put together an indoor painting arena at the hotel itself. And so we, uh, we're going to be projecting large screen HD video of the places that we're going painting. So when we're out, when, when we're all out painting in Chrissy field at golden gate park, the people who don't want to go out and deal with the city issues, they can stay in the hotel and paint the same exact scene and you know they'll see the trees moving and the wind blowing and they'll hear the birds and it's not quite the same but you know uh, i i can understand for some people who just are a little intimidated by cities that's a good option so uh that's oh fascinating something we'll do this year and and uh we've had a number of people say they're going to use it because uh you know that they just you know they don't want to deal with parking well great no, well, that's that to me is one of the most amazing parts of of the conventions. You know, all all the information that's available, but going out to paint with three to five to seven hundred people. Oh, it's so much fun, and it's historical. Uh, John Stern always talks about how historically important it is, and nothing like this has ever happened in history. And when you're out there, I don't know if you've been, but when you're out there in a sea of people, and you walk through the crowd. First off, you're not crowded at all. It's you, You'd think you would be, but it's everybody spread out. You see a yeah. thousand different versions and compositions that you never would have thought of. And then you've got uh, the faculty members who've got their, you know, we've got this way you can flag them down and they'll come up. And uh, one lady told me, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, she says, I can't believe Matt Smith stopped and talked to me and worked on my painting and told me a couple of things that completely changed everything. And, and, you know, it was worth that alone was worth the trip. So to have the faculty members out there working with you, my goal when I, when I first created this Clark was that I wanted to go to the, I, I wanted it to have the benefit of a workshop where you watch the demo and then you try it yourself. And so the, the big difference, of course, in this case is you're watching, you get to watch 30 or 40 demos and, and different kinds yeah. of styles. And, but you get to, you know, pick the ones you watch in that particular day. And then you take your notes and you go out to the field and you try the six or eight tips that you learn that are really critical. And you want to cement them right away while you're thinking about them. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been a pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the Planner podcast. And you are a rock star painter. Uh, I wish I could paint as beautifully as you, but I guess uh, if I can put in 50 years, I'll maybe I'll get close. <laughs> that, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again to Clark Mitchell. And Clark, I'm looking forward to getting out there in Sonoma and painting with you. And we're going to be out at a winery during the plein air convention. And we're going to be nearby you. That area, just driving around there, is just so much beauty. I uh, I may want to try to spend the weekend. I wonder if I can sell that to my wife. Maybe she could come out and join me. That's a good thing to do is just kind of take the weekend. And after the convention, spend it in wine country, go visit the wineries. I know some of the people from the staff, uh, from the team, are going to be they're going to like get a hotel room and hang out together for the weekend, get a limousine, go from winery to winery, and they'll probably be no good on Monday, but that's okay. They deserve it. <laughs> this is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. Okay, the Marketing Minute. I'll try to answer your questions, and of course, you can always email me, eric at Plen Air magazine.com. Okay, here we go. Here's a question or a comment actually from Lindy Cook Severins. She says that I wanted to let you know that I've been a member of Art Marketing in a Box now for two years and I've gone from the person who would not send a newsletter for fear of annoying people to the artist who counts her monthly newsletter as the top sales tool in her arsenal. So she said, remind everybody not to 
give up too quickly. She said, thank you, Eric, and your team. Uh, she blogs a couple times a month. She does three to five Facebook posts weekly. She sends postcards. She sends websites. And, of course, Art Marketing in a Box is a product that's got all that stuff kind of pre-written for you. Anyway, uh, she's having good luck with it, and so she wanted to thank me for that. I, I should mention, Lindy, that also I just heard from Paula Christensen, who's also in the Art Marketing in a Box group. We have a private group. We kind of give you marketing feedback and lessons and you know ideas and stuff in the private group if, if you have that product. But anyway, Paula sent me a note. She said she increased her sales over 2017 by 37% by using art marketing in a box. So that's pretty cool. Thank you both, Lindy and Paula. Here's one from Ursula Born, I think. Born, B-O-J-O-R-N with the umlauts over the O. Born, Bjorn? Anyway, Ursula is from Stockholm, Sweden, Sweden. Anyway, she says, I love listening to the American painters and you should interview some good plein air painters from Sweden too. I think that's a great idea, Ursula. I'll do it. Send me their names. Anyway, uh, her question is, I'm wondering if an artist from Europe could succeed as an artist in America selling their artwork. And so what would we do to go about it? Well, first off, I think that being from Europe is an advantage because one of the things that will happen, I walk into galleries, I don't tell them that I'm involved in the art world. I just walk in, see what they say. I'll ask about a painter. They'll oftentimes, if it's a foreign painter, the first thing they say is, you know, this, this artist is from France or this artist is from Paris or from England. And it kind of creates this mystique with we Americans. And so I suspect the same would be true for Americans selling in other countries, right? If Americans uh, were selling in Paris, they'd say, hey, this is an American painter. Anyway, I think the key is uh, if you're selling in that environment, well, you got to figure out how you're going to do it. You can either sell direct online or through other some uh, other means but if you're going to get a gallery then you want to get invited in make them comfortable with how they're going to deal with the things that they have to deal with that you might not be thinking about so like how do they deal with the exchange rate how do they transfer money to you do they send checks does that work how do they deal with shipping paintings are you shipping paintings to them i've got a good gallery friend who deals in russian paintings and, and russian artists and so the artists send them in tubes. They take them off the stretcher bars. They roll them up. They wait till they're dry. They send them in tubes. And then uh, he sets up these ATM accounts with credit cards. And so they can just use their credit cards, which is pretty cool for them. So he just puts the money in. He doesn't have to worry about exchange rates. And they don't have to either. They're buying with American money. So that's pretty cool. I don't know if it's legal. You'd have to check into that. But I think as long as you're a good painter, take advantage of the mystique by being from another place. And I think Americans, you should do that too. You know, a lot of art is being sold in China. Why not get into a Chinese gallery? Anyway, next question is from Lee Winslow of Charlotte, North Carolina, writes, Mr. Rhodes. I always correct people when they say Mr. Rhodes because Mr. Rhodes is my grandfather. He's not living anymore, but he was Mr. Rhodes. I'm Eric. Please call me Eric. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, she says, is it possible or advisable to have different names when selling your art. For instance, she says, I paint in different styles and my current gallery doesn't want the other st the styles, but I think they would sell too. What are your thoughts on this? Well, the question is interesting. Uh, is it dishonest? No, it doesn't have to be. You know, actors, radio DJs, I, you know, I was a radio DJ for a lot of years. I had a lot of different air names or stage names. It's pretty common um, that to use a different name because sometimes people have really difficult names. They're hard to spell. They don't mark it well. So if your name is uh, Jubilabluksky, then maybe you should change it to Jones. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I do know artists who do this. They're upfront about it with their galleries. They'll say, you know, can I give you work, a uh, different kind of work that doesn't look like my work, and sign it with a different name? And if you don't let me do that, do you mind if I go ahead and put it in some other galleries or maybe not in the same city? And some of them are okay with it. Some of them are not. It kind of just depends on the state of the gallery. There's also, you know, if like if you're painting abstract in one style and it's not at all looking like your other work, then it's probably okay. But again, you, you don't want to try to deceive people, but you want to make sure that the galleries that you're dealing with know what's going on. Also, you know, you got to think about well, what happens if, you know, you've got two websites as two artists, you've got two pictures, people put two and two together, you know. My, my way of doing things is you never do anything that you don't want on the cover of the New York Times, right? You want to do things upright and legit. 
I know painters who uh, will make up fake names and they'll sign fake names on like their dog paintings or the paintings they don't want to sell. They're sitting around in their garage and they'll put them out on eBay for a couple hundred bucks each and they don't want their name on them. But if there's anything recognizable, you know, if, if everybody knows, oh, that's you, then that's probably uh, something you want to consider. I can't tell you if it's right or wrong. I know people do it. I don't have uh, the opinion of a gallery owner, but um, I have heard a couple things from time to time that sometimes it's cool, sometimes it's not. So you got to decide if you're uncomfortable about doing it. Anyway, um, uh, anyway, that's kind of kind of my thought on it. I don't have anything more to offer. I'm not so sure that's a great marketing question. Well, it's not a bad question. I just don't know if it's really going to teach anything about marketing. Anyway, that's the marketing minute today. I hope um, we'll see you in San Francisco. We're going to have a really good time there. And remember, we've developed this new thing, and that new thing is if you don't want to deal with San Francisco stuff like traffic or parking, and by the way, we've got that pretty well under control. We hired a traffic consultant. But if you don't want to go out to the paint spots after our indoor sessions, uh, then we have indoor painting sessions that you can do, and we're going to be projecting on the big screen. So that's going to make it easier. We're also working on some transportation options if you don't want to take Uber or lift, although they're all very close locations, except for wine country, which is a little further away. Anyway, that's the marketing minute. Okay, by the way, if you have not seen my blog where I talk about art, life, and lots of other things, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. Uh, you know, we had like up to 100,000 people uh, on that thing. I just can't even believe it. I mean, I don't know that there's 100,000 people up on Sunday mornings. No, anyway. This is fun. Let's do it again sometime like next week. I know I'm up on Sunday mornings heading to church. Anyway, we'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.